This, this morning and be over in Luke chapter 14 to start with. I, if you were expecting the sermon on uh, the distinctives of being a Baptist, I'm going to push that off. I just feel like the Lord's calling an audible on my sermon today and uh, I just kind of have something else on my heart. So if we could, let's turn over to Luke chapter number 14 and we'll get back to it. Um, I tell you what, uh, I, I'm thankful for being a Baptist and a lot of people don't realize the significance of that. So definitely come back if you want to hear uh, things that make Baptists different than every other Christian denomination out there. And last week I covered the, the fact that I mean, they admit this. There was a documentary that came out just recently that discussed this, and they even drew it out on a graph. But that Baptists are the only denomination out there, and of course, when I say denomination, we're independent. We're not part of a denomination, okay? Like, we're not, there's nobody in, you know, no, no uh, church over the top of us, the, the, no uh, organization in Nashville, Tennessee that owns our property or anything like that. We're an independent Baptist church. But one of the things that d makes Baptist distinct, one of them that I covered last week, is the way of salvation and the fact that we believe that once a person's saved, they're always saved. And every uh, it was graphed out in this documentary trying to debunk Baptist doctrine, and they, they showed this tree of Christianity, and an entire one side of the tree, everything basically other than Baptist, uh, are this say you can lose your salvation. I mean, every other denomination of Christianity. Problem is, if you think you can lose your salvation based upon your sin or your merit, or, or, or you have to keep your salvation by your merit or whatever, guess what that is? The Bible calls that works salvation. And guess what? You're not saved at all because it's not by grace. For by grace are you, or not by works, it's for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's a gift, and you can't work for a gift. The moment you try to work for a gift, guess what? It's not a gift anymore. Hey, it might be a good deal. The moment you pay for a gift, it's not, you know, like here's a gift. Oh, hey, I got something. Let me give you something for it at least. Not a gift anymore the minute you pay for it. It might be a good deal. But thank God, he didn't say, you know, cut out and clip coupons to get into heaven and get a good deal to get into heaven. No, he said it's a free gift over and over. Romans, what is that? Romans chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, over and over. Thank God. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the gift of God is eternal life. Praise God, we don't have to work for it or anything like that. Well, anyway, listen to that sermon from last week if you want to hear more on that. Today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 14. And uh, Luke chapter 14 to begin with. And I want you to read beginning in verse 23. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, is not, and not, is not able to finish it all, uh, it all, or it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to. To finish, notice this. He says, "You build." They, they what, what person? What kind of person would do this? They would intend to build something, and then they don't plan it out. Uh, today, they kind of go overboard almost uh, on the city permitting and all of that. But there's a purpose to that, isn't there? Uh, you know, uh, many times in third world countries, they build a building, and the first earthquake, first windstorm, they just collapse all over the place, right? Uh, but there's a purpose, uh, and, and there's a story. I'll tell you. Uh, this, there's a famous story. I didn't look it up but because I'm not going to spend much time on it. But they, uh, when they put in the bid for the contract to build a bridge, they missed a zero on the contract. And the bridge, the money for building the bridge, uh, this company, they won the bid. You know, they were the best price. But the money ran out halfway across, and it sat there for a long time before they ever, you know, I think they even just built another bridge because it was just, you know. A thing. So the point here is that it's going to cost something. If you're going to build something, there's going to be a cost. In uh, Luke chapter 14, looking down at verse number 30, uh, verse number 31. Or what king going to make war to, uh, against another king sitteth not down first and consulting uh, consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. Or else why the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and a desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever uh, he, be, uh, uh, he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. 
Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewithal shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet uh, for the dunghill. But men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I want to preach a sermon today about building and battling. Building and battling. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd help me as I preach. Lord, these scattered thoughts, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring them together in the hearts and minds of people today. Fill me with your Spirit and everyone here listening, God. I, without you, I can do nothing, but I do put my faith in you to help me today. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to notice here that there is a battle that we have to fight. And there is a, a building that we have to build. I want you to think about this, this analogy that's given here as we're going to go to some other passages of Scripture. But I want you to notice here that he says, uh, he brings this down to the, ty the, the, uh, the idea of being a disciple. It says in verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. There's a a false doctrine out there that is basically sa that says that you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life and you have to be a sold out, dedicated Christian and, and willing to give up everything in order to get to heaven, in order to get into sal uh, salvation. My friends, uh, that's the Lordship Salvationist. That's your John MacArthur and uh, John Piper. and uh, But basically many other uh, works-based religions out there will teach that you have to do this. And the biggest problem is, is the misunderstanding of reading all of the things that Jesus said that we have to do in order to be a disciple and trying to apply that to the free gift of salvation. My friends, I want you to understand something. The free gift of salvation has nothing to do with your daily life and the way you live and repenting of your sins and stopping sinning and getting right and doing things and building and battling for Jesus. My friend, when you get saved, you get saved by just putting your faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing can save you but what Jesus did on the cross. And people that say you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I'd like to see the guy that made Jesus true and completely the Lord of his life that stays that kneeled down and stayed knelt down my friends it just takes me a few minutes to get back up off the altar it just takes me a few minutes to make him not Lord anymore in my life and I'm like Lord I want to do it again I want to do right but it doesn't take my our, 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 us long to get our eyes off of Jesus my friend those are some self-righteous prideful people who think that 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 they oh look at me I'm going to get into heaven because I made Jesus the Lord of my life my friends, that is not how you get saved. You don't get saved by confessing all your sins. You get saved by confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God hath raised Him from the dead. The Bible says, Thou shalt be saved. You say, but, but it, it says you have to build. It says you have to battle. And if you don't, uh, aren't willing to give up all, then you can't be His disciple. Well, listen, a disciple is different than a believer. A disciple is one who is going to be sold out and who's willing to do anything. If God called your number this morning and said, I want you to be a, 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 a missionary to Malawi, would you answer that call? If God called your number and said, I want you to be a preacher of the gospel, would you answer that call? If God called your number and said, I want you to be out soul winning on Saturday, would you answer that call? If God called your number and, called, and wanted you to be, do something for Him in the church and wanted you to serve God, would, would you do it? You see, listen, I want you to understand something. You, God has given us a free gift of salvation. It's a, a free gift. And listen, there's going to be a lot of people up in heaven. There are going to be a lot of people up there with no rewards, no pats on the back, no well done, thou good and faithful servant. Hey, let's give this guy a standing ovation. Well, amen, as they come on in. 24 preachers, 24 elders, they get crowns put upon their heads as the best pastors throughout the ages. I know what that's not me. I, I'm just, you know, I know there's a lot of great pastors out there. But so, somebody's going to get that reward. Somebody's going to get that honor. My friend, there, but there's going to be also a lot that are ashamed at his coming, the Bible says. There are a lot of people that are going to be there at that gathering in the air. A multitude of every kindred, tribe, and tongue, the Bible says, that's going to appear in heaven. And these are they that came out of great tribulation, the Bible says. And there's going to be a lot of them with nothing to show for it. Some guy said, I'd rather be the, you know, I'd rather, what, what, what's the saying? I'd rather reign in hell than, you know, or whatever, than serve in heaven. But I'm telling you what, I'd rather serve in heaven 
than reign in hell. Hell, you, you won't reign. You won't even be able to see anybody in that place of outer darkness. You'll be in pain and suffering. And you'll be in torment for all eternity. That's why we go soul winning. This, this preacher was asked one time, what kind of preacher should I be? Should I be a soft preacher? Or should I be a hellfire and brimstone preacher? And the guy gave one response. The old preacher said, is there a hell? Answer that question. Then it should answer itself. If there's really a burning hell, then what should we be doing? We should be telling people about Jesus. Is there a hell? Now, think about this. Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Let me ask you, does the Lord have your heart? Does he have your heart? Are you willing to forsake everything? Is there a, a thing that you wouldn't do for, for God? Now, the point here that he's giving is that, listen, it doesn't cost you to get saved. It costs Jesus to get saved. Did you know the Bible tells us that he bare all our sins in his own body on the tree? I mean, how many of, how many of our sins did Jesus die for? Everyone. Everyone. He did all the work. And then on top of this, he says, just to make sure you understand it's a free gift that you get into heaven. He says, look, when you get up there, if you, anything that you do for me, I'm going to give you rewards for down there, uh, up here. Anything you do in Christ's name, these things, he gives rewards up in heaven. He act, it recognizes that that's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Notice here, I want you to see building, building. The Bible says this, which of you intending, verse number 28, to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he had laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him. We're talking about the Christian life now. If you'll hold your place here, I'd like you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. When we go out and preach the gospel, we tell people, all you have to do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. It's really that simple. What a great thing that is, that it's a free gift. But I want you to understand something. I want you to note, note this. It is a shame when a Christian starts serving God and starts going to church, but they get out and they quit. It's a shame. The Bible t says that. They begin to mock him. You know, there were 10 lepers that were healed. Jesus healed them just like that. Do you remember the story? How many thanked Jesus that came back to thank him? That's right, one. One came back. All nine just went on their way. Is that what we want to be? I'm, listen, how many of you, and you can say amen, how many of you are thankful for salvation? Amen? Say amen. You don't raise your hand. This is a Baptist church. How many of you are thankful for your salvation? Amen. amen. There it is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Preach the preacher, right? Help me out here. Let me know. I, I know you can agree with me on that point at least. Amen. I had you turn over to... Um, 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read this again to you. The Bible says, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he be sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock, to mock him. Now, notice that word foundation. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. And I, there's no doubt that Paul is referencing this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'd like you to jump down to um, verse number, let's look at verse number 6. The Bible says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, understand, we as Christians, if we're going to build for Christ, we're going to receive rewards in heaven. If we'll battle for Christ, we're going to receive rewards in heaven. Notice this. How do we, how do we build? 
For we are laborers together with God. Yesterday when our church went out on the mission to preach the gospel, the Holy Spirit was with us. He's, Jesus said, Lo, I will be with you always, even unto the uttermost parts of the, to, the end of the earth. I'm sorry. He said, Ye are God's building. Now, we're laborers together with God. We're teamed up with God. He fills us with His Spirit. He's working with us. Now, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man, I want you to mark this, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, thereupon. Now, that's what I want to talk to you about first of all today, is I want you to take heed how you build upon your life. Now, notice the next verse. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I want you to imagine your life like a building. The foundation, you got saved. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The foundation of Jesus Christ is, is your life. Now, you're going to build your life. You're going to build your life. What is your life? What are you going to do with your life? You take those stones and, and you think, picture the things that make up your life, your hobbies, your interests, the things that occupy your time, your labor, your effort. Are there any spiritual stones that are building that up? Are you building anything upon it? He's reminding us, listen, it, listen, take heed. Think about how you're going to build your life. What are you going to do with your life? The foundation is Jesus Christ. And thank God, that foundation can never waver. Listen, it's going to say in just a minute, it's going to tell us, if we have that foundation, we're in. We're in heaven. Our place is in heaven. Our names are written down. And there's nothing that can blot your name out. Praise God. But look, I'd, I'd like to have a little something up there in heaven. I'd like to have a little something. I'd like to, to hear the Lord say, hey, good job down there while you were down there. In all of eternity. I'm going to be thinking, more. I wish I'd have done a little more. I'd like to have something up there. Notice what he says. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest or revealed for that day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. The word sort there, this is the type. What type it is. Now, when you apply fire to gold, what happens? It melts, it melts right? But it still exists, right? Yeah. They'll actually put fire to it and purify it, right? Like, if it's, if it's like 22 karat gold, they can stick it in there, and that means it's too... Uh, Two parts of 24, I forget the numbers there, but you can actually, they can actually take out whatever they added, the silver they added to it or whatever, and uh, purge it even more. It's still there. Same with silver, right? They can get 999 silver or 9999 silver or 90% silver or whatever, and they can purge it and clean it up and, and add fire. It's still there, and it just, the fire just purifies it and makes it even, even better. Precious stones, they're still there. Those things represent the things we do for Christ. However, the wood, the hay, and the stubble. What happens, what happens when you apply fire to wood, hay, and stubble? Ashes. Ashes, right. It burns up, and there's and what's left after that? Nothing. And there's some, going to be some Christians up in heaven, and they're like, what do you have to show for it? And they're just like, ashes, nothing. Those are, represent all the things that we do that don't have any eternal merit, eternal value. It's go, the fire is going to reveal every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, notice that verse 14, after the fire has tried it, the wood, hay, and stubble is gone. The gold, silver, and precious stones, they're the ones that are remaining. The Bible says, which he hath built thereupon. Notice this. Mark this one as well. He shall receive a reward. Wow. Wow. Listen, this life is short. Hey, I'm, I'm like in the, my middle ages now, but I, you know, like life is just going by faster than ever before when I was a kid. And I talk to people that are a little ahead of me in the game. 
and they're just like, whoa, where did the time go? Where did the time go? I mean, hey, we're all heading out of here one day. And I'm telling you, we're going to get up there and we're going to wish we would have got on this sooner, started building a little better and a little faster, a little stronger, a little harder. Amen. Let this sink in. If any man's work shall be burned, wood, hay, and stubble, he shall suffer loss. There's going to be people up there that, that are like, oh, oh, man, I hope I get something. It's my turn. It's my turn. And it's just like, God's like, well, well, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, okay, you know, next. But he himself shall be saved, set so as by fire. I love, mark that part too if you want to mark it. But he himself shall be saved, yet so has by fire. You know what that means? That means you don't have to do a single thing for God. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to go soul winning. And you're still in. Praise God. And thank God that's the grace of God right there. You say, that's not fair. Thank, thank God. Thank God is that God is loving so much that he loved the whole world. And he wants everybody to go to heaven. And anybody who will just believe on him. Believe on him can be saved. I'm thankful that it's not by works because I don't think my works would stack up. You know what paid for our way in is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If it was a works, none of us would get in. Not a one of us. Thank God. Thank God. He said, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. People have this idea salvation is this uh, thing where you try to weigh out the good and the bad when you get up there to Peter's gate or whatever. No, my friends, here's how it would work. Jesus, Jesus works in our sins, our good deeds. I mean, Jesus wins every time. Listen, it's Jesus' record. It's Jesus' way that we get in. We, we have nothing on that side. Listen, when we get in, then he says, hey, you know, come over here and let's give you your rewards for heaven. You get in by the grace of God. Now, I want you to notice this as well. No, verse 16, know ye not that, ye are, the, you're, that you, ye are the temple of God and that your, the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Did you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God? When you got saved, the Holy Spirit literally came inside of you and lived in you. How many of you have felt that, that the Lord has put an impression upon your heart either to do a good thing or not do a bad thing? Would you raise your hand? Amen. You've experienced it. I think there should be a, maybe even more people raising their hand. That's, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's the Holy Spirit. He doesn't speak in an audible voice, right? People are hearing voices. I don't know. I mean, yeah. But anyway, but no, he does. He impresses us. He speaks to us. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Wow. What we do in our body, we can actually wreck our life. We can wreck our temple. For the temple of God is holy, whose temple is ye are. He goes on to explain some of these things. I want you to turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Take heed how you build thereon. I beseech you, verse 1, therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your re reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The most reasonable thing we can do for a person that's been born again, saved by the blood of Jesus, is to lay our lives our, our will, our emotions, our, our intellect, and, and just say, God, your ways are right, my ways are wrong. And say, here am I, Lord, send me. What would you have me to do, God? I'm yours to control. My life is yours. I surrender all. That's the greatest thing that you could do as a Christian. But you know what? I had a guy tell me one time, now, I feel like the Lord, you know, if I gave, if I surrendered my heart to Christ as a Christian, the Lord would call me to some country in Africa or co some country in South America. And I, I don't, I don't want to do that. 
So I'm just not going to sell out for Jesus. I'm not going to surrender my heart to the Lord. I'm not going to get faithful in church. I'll be a Sunday morning Christian. I'll go that far. But I don't want, it, I don't, I don't want God to just have complete control over my life. The Bible says that's your reasonable service after saving your soul from hell. That's your reasonable service. It's hard preaching today. Turn over to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I am crucified, verse 20, I'm sorry, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Paul looked at himself as a crucified man. He said, you know what, I'm going I'm, I'm to look at myself dead as a dead person to my desires and all of that. And I'm going to do for what I can for Christ, whatever Christ wants. That's what I'm going to do. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Turn over to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. The Bible says in John 21 verse 15, so when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Speaking of the fish. You see, Jesus had rose from the dead <clears throat> But Peter and some of the disciples went fishing. That was their career before they, they went and became a, a fisher of men. Jesus had prepared a meal on the, sh the shores and uh, pointed at the fish and said, Do you love me more than these? And he said, Yes, Lord, yea, Lord, for thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my lambs. And he said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou lovest, knowest that I love thee. And he saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he had asked, said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Knowest, thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now this, uh, you might not understand what he's saying here, but God had a purpose and a, a, a calling for Peter to be the pastor of the, the church at Jerusalem. And he did an amazing work. And the word pastor comes from the word pasture. And the pastor is a shepherd. Jesus is the chief shepherd. And the, the pastor is the leader of the local church. And the Bible calls us all sheep, right? And the, she, the pastor's job is to feed and protect the, sh the, the, the flock, to feed the spiritual meat of the word, the, the word of God, preaching to them. But you know what Peter had to do? Is he had to show that he loved Jesus more than fishing. And you can insert anything there that Jesus is saying. Do you love me more than NFL football? Mm. Do you love me more than movies in Hollywood? Mm. Do you love me more than this hobby or that entertainment? Do you love me more than these, Jesus says? Maybe calling one of you. Maybe God has a purpose for your life beyond just, you know, what you're doing now. Jesus said to him, I have a plan for you. Feed my sheep. You're going to be a pastor preaching the gospel. You're going to be leading people to do great works in the city of Jerusalem. But Peter, do you really, do you love me? Are you willing to sell out and do, do whatever it takes? Are you willing to, to, to look at the building that needs to be built? Count the cost and be willing to be a disciple? Because he said, if you're not willing to give all and leave all behind, you're not worthy to be my disciple, Jesus said. God can use us if we'll surrender all. You know the old song, I surrender all. That's what he wants. He says this in verse 18, Verily, verily, I say unto you, thee, when thou wast young and thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest, 
But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird, gird thee and carry thee uh, whither the, soever, uh, whither thou wouldest. And he spake this, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said, he said, said unto him, follow me. Listen, let me tell you something. Peter, uh, history tells us he died. Uh, you know, well, we don't know for sure, but he died upside down on a cross is the story. And he said, listen, you know, it costs to serve God. I mean, sometimes his, sometimes missionaries are killed. They've been eaten. <laughs> There's all kinds of people that have been martyrs for the cause of Christ. But let me ask you a question. Are you willing to count the cost? You need to count it. Look and say, God has something for my life, and I know He does. Am, are you willing? Do you love me more than all of this? Do you love me more than property, land, wealth, and houses, all these things? Do you love me even more than some friendships and relationships in your life? Do you love me more than all? And are you willing to give all and follow, follow Christ? Leave all and follow Christ. We'll close with Matthew chapter 6. I've got so many thoughts and verses here, but as you're turning to Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said this in Matthew 16, 24. Then he said, said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. and Take up his cross and follow me. That doesn't mean you have to deny yourself to get saved. You have to believe on Jesus to be saved. But if you're going to follow Christ and to go wherever He sends you and go, go do whatever He says and follow His call and purpose and direction in your life, you're going, to have to, you're going to have to give up some stuff that's going to hold you back. You know, the Bible says there are sins and uh, that so easily beset us. There's weights and those types of things. We're going to have to look unto Jesus, sell out and give it all for Christ. Would you be willing to die for Christ? I'm not going to tell you, ask you to raise your hand, but, but if, if they came and said, no church tomorrow in America... Would you go to church? They said, no preaching the gospel. Would you preach the gospel? They said, you do it, you die. Would you, preach the, would you still preach the gospel that Jesus commanded us to preach? We don't need permission. We got the commission, don't we? Amen. And let me ask you this. Are you willing to live for Christ? You say, I, I think I would die for Christ. Well, would you live for him? Would you live for him? I told the story of John Harper. He was the Baptist preacher that was on board the Titanic. And for like three hours, the ship's going down, and people know they're going to die. The, they're up, way up in the north, like Newfoundland area, out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's just going down for hours, sinking slowly. People are super selfish, fighting for seats on the lifeboats because there's only about enough for a third of the people. But this Baptist preacher is going around and... and getting people saved and telling them m women, children, and the unsaved onto the lifeboats, helping them get on and then praying with people and giving, uh, getting people saved on that boat. Would you do that? If a plane went down and you had like five minutes to go uh, as it was crashing, would you, would you be telling people about Jesus, how to be saved? Or would you be panicking and screaming, you know, and, and yelling out and losing your mind? Well, listen, if, they can, if he was able to do that then, why can't we do it now when we see somebody on the street or, you know, at the very least give somebody a track as you're going through the wall, you know, going through the drive through Matthew 10, 37 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is, is not worthy of me. He that loveth daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. People like, well, this is my time. It's my life. I'll do with it. But he said, listen, if you listen to what he says again, listen to this again, listen to this again. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Mm. Mm. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. People are trying to save their life and use it for themselves. But he said, man, Matthew 6, <laughs> verse number 33 but seek ye first. I had you turn there. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. What's first? Getting people saved into the kingdom of God. Things of God, church, God, the Bible. And His righteousness. You live in a clean, pure life. You know, the, the best life is the blessed life. 
And look, you live a life that God can bless. Because He can't bless ugly. He can't bless mean. He can't bless hateful. He can't bless impure and dirty. He can't do it. But He can bless a sold-out Christian that loves the Lord and is sharing the gospel and is trying to confess their sins and keep it clean and do what they're supposed to do. Seek, your, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for tomorrow shall take the thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In the, earlier in the passage, he says, you know what? Some of you are worried about your clothing. Some of you are, are obsessed with where, your food and all of your stuff. Verse 25, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? We live in a country that's obsessed with food. Just look at people's Facebooks, right? Food and raiment. I mean, in this generation, they were worried about like finding clothing because it was very rare and expensive. But now it's just an overabundance of clothing. People have more clothes than they know what to do with. And they're like, they, every few years, they just got to do this huge purge of 20 boxes to Goodwill. And what a blessing that we have, you know, in America. But now people are obsessed with clothing and all these things and, and all this. But notice what he says. Don't worry about those things. I want you to, I want you to underline this phrase here. Is not the life more? Is not the life more? There's more to life than physical things. There's more to life. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. Let's put Christ first in our life. He said this, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost where he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he laid the foundation, is not able to finish it all, or finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus is the foundation. He says, take heed how you build, how you build thereon. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to pray and be dismissed here in just a second. But I want to ask you, I want to ask you, do you believe that the, that the Lord is speaking to your heart and maybe, maybe God is dealing with you in some area that he doesn't have control of? Maybe you're not... You know, as he said, maybe you're not fit for the kingdom. Maybe you're not worthy to be called his dis disciple. Thank God, through the grace of God, we're saved by grace. There's no works that's required to get into heaven. But I don't want to be a, a poor example. I don't want to be a mockery. I want to be one who's trusted in Christ and is building upon the foundation 